Nassau Community College on 90.3 WHPC. You use Tearless Baby Shampoo because it's gentle on your baby's eyes. You make sure his toys don't have any sharp edges. You always test the bath water to make sure it's not too hot. You taught her what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. You make sure she wears a helmet when she rides her bicycle. You put on his sunscreen, even when he's embarrassed his friends will see. You do so much to keep your child safe. But are you using the right car seat for your child? Is your child facing the right way in the car seat? Is the seat too big or too small? How do you know when it's time to move your child into the next type of seat? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. For information on the right seat for your child, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. That's safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. You are listening to Beyond the Game on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I am Jake Volk, sitting across from me, Brandon Johnson and Dominic Arbolino, and we are fortunate enough to be joined by Todd Stanley, the author of the book, They Wore Red Socks and Pinstripes, Players Who Went to the Enemy. Todd, how are you? Good. about yourself? I'm doing good. Thanks for taking the time to do this. Good. Thank you for having me. So, what exactly is your book about? So, um, you know, I always thought I was very... I'm, I'm a history teacher, so I'm a what-if guy. So, what if this had happened, or what if that had happened? And so, I, I often wondered, like, what it would be for, like, these players who are so synonymous with their team. So, like, Derek Jeter, who's synonymous with the Yankees. You hear Derek Jeter, you say Yankees. What would it have been for him to go play for the Red Sox, which are, you know, their intense mm, rival? Ouch. Well, what would have been, yeah, what would have been for David Ortiz to have played for the, the Yankees? Would that have ever happened? And so it kind of started, the Colonel started with that. And I was just got me curious as to how many people had played for both teams. And so I started doing a little, a little research. And then I found out there were over 300 players that played for both teams. And so I just started to, you know, I knew a little bit of the rivalry. Um, I got caught up in that 2003, 2004, um, when, uh, you know, uh, Aaron Boone hit the walk-off home run. Sure. And then the next year, the Red Sox came back from 3-0 deficit. Got real caught up in that. And so as I just started to do more research, it became more and more, more interesting and more fascinating for me until I finally, like, kind of put a book proposal together and sent it to McFarland, and, uh, and they accepted that. All right. How would baseball history be different if Babe Ruth had stayed with the Red Sox? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And so when you look at the numbers that he put up for the Yankees, well, first off, the question becomes, would he have remained a pitcher? Because he pitched for the Boston primarily. Yeah. And yep. then when he went to the Yankees, he I think he pitched a game or two, not much. I think he went 6-0 um, and as a Yankee. I know he was undefeated, but I'm not sure yeah. of the exact record. Yeah. So, you know, it would have been really interesting, like – if baseball would have been changed because, you know, Babe Ruth becoming a hitter and then starting to hit home runs, that completely changed baseball. And that, you know, Ty Cobb, who was an excellent hitter, there was a story that um, one time, you know, when the home run craze was starting, Ty Cobb got up and he hit three home runs in the game. He said, see how easy it is? And then he went back to hitting doubles and triples because he didn't <laughs> think it was worthy. And so you got to wonder, like, how baseball might be different had Babe Ruth not, you know, in the live ball era had not made home runs so prominent because, you know, when Babe Ruth broke the record, he like bro- he, he didn't just break it; he you know massacred it. I mean, the record before had been paltry, and he you know he he, he killed that record. And so, um, it would have been really interesting. And you know, I don't think Boston would have had that much more success because they sold off a, not just him; they sold off tons of players during that era. Um, if you look at the exchange between the Yankees and Boston during that time. Um, it was like uh, Boston was the minor league team for the Yankees, basically. You can thank Ed um, Barrow for that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you exactly. had to choose, uh, what team do you like more, the Yankees or the Red Sox? You know, I, 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 will, I will say this. I have great respect for the Yankees. I mean, any team that can win 25, out of, 25 World Series out of 100 years in the, you know, in the 20th century, you have to respect. So I have great respect for the Yankees. But I, I do prefer the, uh, the Boston team. You know, I got caught up with those, the idiots, you know, with, um, you know, um, Johnny Damon and David Ortiz and all those guys, Kevin Euclid. I, I got caught up with those guys. And so, 
Um, I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself a huge Boston fan, but if those two are playing, I would definitely be rooting for Boston. Talking to Todd Stanley, the author of the excellent book. I can't recommend this enough. I have it. I've read it. I really love it. They wore Red Sox and pinstripes, players who went to the enemy. So staying with that train of thought, do you think that the Yankees-Red Sox rivalry is the best rivalry in all of sports? Because I do. Yeah, I do. You know, it's funny. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, and, uh, you know, Michigan and Ohio State is one of the biggest rivalries in sports, like, to the point where here in, in you know, the Ur- Urban Meyer won't even say Michigan. He calls them the team up north. Yep. And so there's this huge rivalry that I'm kind of in the middle of. I've been in the middle of my whole life. But I don't think it's as big as the Yankees and Red Sox. Um and you know that there's that. Um, there, I was watching that game when Jason Veritek and Alex Rodriguez won at it, um, and where you know Rodriguez got an inside pitch, he went towards the mound, and Veritek and him started at it. And you know, I, I it was so intense. And then I was also well, I happened to be watching the game when um, Pedro Martinez threw Don Zimmer down to the ground. Um, oh, you know, when when the bench was cleared, and so so that that intensity was just so um, it, it was. Like I said, I've not seen it in other sports um, as much as that. I mean, sure, there are rivalries. Um, there are other rivalries. But I think that, that that one, it's got a long story tradition, too. I mean, from the very first game they played at, with each other, they got into a bench-clearing brawl. So, you know, it's it's been going on for a long time. Yeah, it's a lot of history between the two teams. Uh, can oh. you lay out for us the almost swap of Joe DiMaggio for Ted Williams? Sure. So I get, you know, the owners of the Yankees and the Red Sox got together at a bar and, or it was a, it was a restaurant or something of that nature. I think and there was in, liquor involved. Yeah. yeah there, I'm sure there was a lot of liquor involved. <laughs> so anyways, in principle, on word, they agreed to a swap of DiMaggio, you know, for Ted Williams. Um, and then the next day, um, the Yankees, or I'm sorry, the Red Sox uh, owner was like, you know what? No, I, I'm not going to go straight up. I want you to throw in this rookie who happened to be Yogi Berra. And, oh, wow. um, yeah. And so Jeez. when he, when he asked for Yogi Berra in addition to, you know, to, um, Joe DiMaggio, cause Joe DiMaggio was towards the end of his career. I mean, he was not in his heyday. Let's put it that way. Um, so, um, with the addition of Yogi Berra though, the Yankees owner called it off. And so, but it would have been really interesting to have Ted Williams, you know, play in Yankee Stadium with that short, you know, right field porch. And it would have been interesting to have Joe DiMaggio play in Boston with the, the wall, the Green Monster. Um, how the, their games would have translated to that would have been interesting. Definitely, definitely. So uh, how exactly was Alec Rodriguez almost traded to the Red Sox instead of eventually being traded to the Yankees? Well, it all comes down to Aaron Boone playing basketball now, doesn't it? <laughs> so, you know, Aaron Boone, for some odd reason, you know, after being the hero of the 2003 World Series, and I, you know, I'm a huge Reds fan, so when he went to the Yankees, I, I knew they were getting a really good player. And they signed him long-term, and he was going to be – I mean, if you look at that, they signed him to, like, a multi-year deal. He was going to be their third baseman of the future. Um, and then when he played basketball and got injured, all of a sudden the Yankees had this hole at third base that they needed to fill. And um, the uh, Red Sox and Alex Rodriguez had agreed in principle to the deal, and Alex Rodriguez was going to take a little bit less to make that deal happen because he went out of the Texas so bad, he was willing to pay some of the, you know, to kind of take a, you know, um, uh, to pay some of his salary so that he could get out of Texas. And, um, but the union wouldn't let them. Yep. And so, uh, but he would have been, uh, Red Sox had Don, C- or, you know, uh, Bud Seeley. If Bud Selig not overturned that, uh, the deal, he would have been with the Red Sox. And to be honest with you, I don't know if they would have won the 2004, 2007, you know, uh, World Series because, you know, if you look at their teams, there's no one huge super. I mean, David Ortiz is a superstar for certain, but they had a very strong team. I mean, they're all, all the way around, they had these role, guys who knew their roles and they knew what they had to do. And none of them were great at it, but every one of them was very good at it. You know, the so, sad part uh, is, I'm a Yankee fan. I really respect that 04 Red Sox team. To come back yeah. from 3 0 down against the Yankees, you know what? I'll give the devil his dues. I really yeah. will. Yeah, well, you know, it was interesting because I was watching, with the, the, I think it was game four, it was, or where they went to, they went to extra inning a couple of times. But I was watching the game. It got to the 10th inning, and I had a tennis match I had to go play. So <laughs> I went out and I played tennis for like two hours um, and then came back, and the game was still on. So I'm sitting at the tennis club, like watching the game on television because it's still going on, and I was like, it was just, I was, it was so amazing that that game, you know, lasted as long as it did, and 
for David Ortiz to be the hero of that game as he's been in so many other ones. Talking to Todd Stanley, the author of They Wore Red Sox and Pinstripes, Players Who Went to the Enemy. And Todd, I'll get you out on this. Can you take us through a typical day for you when you were writing this book? Sure. So, you know, I involved a lot of research. I used the ba- baseballreference.com. I mean, it used, it used to be like there was the baseball encyclopedia. And, you know, I, I had that when they used to come out and they were like thick enough to choke a horse. And now everything is online. So, so typically what I would do is I would go on and I would um, research. I would find the, you know, I, I had a list of the players. I would look at their stats and I would take their stats and put them. And then I would analyze those stats. And, you know, I'm a big Moneyball fan. So, um, I try not to look too much at batting average and wins and losses because we all know that those aren't as valuable as we once thought they were. And so I tried to look at it from other lenses as well. Um, And so I would research the player. um, I would give a little background on them, and then I would look at the numbers. And sometimes it was really obvious, um, you know, uh, when when a player, when you got more out of, uh, you know, whether which team got out of them. But the more fascinating ones were like, you know, Wade Boggs. When you look at, you know, Wade Boggs, um, you know, which – team got the best it's very close uh same thing with uh, roger clemens i mean roger clemens did give them world series in in um you know new york but, but man he pitched so well for the red sox when he was starting out um so you know I, I just would go through and research and then and then i try to find unique ways to make the decision so i didn't want to say batting average every every time batting average is the one that makes the decision so I would look at, you know, what was the major difference between those, the, the two um, playing for the two teams. And so that was kind of, that was really fun and very interesting. All right, Todd. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Todd. Hey, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. It. All right. That was Todd Stanley. His book is They Wore Red Sox and Pinstripes, Players Who Went to the Enemy. Let's take a quick break, but don't go anywhere because we'll be talking football next on Beyond the Game on the voice of Nassau Community College 90.3. WHPC. You use Tearless Baby Shampoo because it's gentle on your baby's eyes. You make sure his toys don't have any sharp edges. You always test the bath water to make sure it's not too hot. You taught her what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. You make sure she wears a helmet when she rides her bicycle. You put on his sunscreen even when he's embarrassed his friends will see. You do so much to keep your child safe. But are you using the right car seat for your child? Is your child facing the right way in the car seat? Is the seat too big or too small? How do you know when it's time to move your child into the next type of seat? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. For information on the right seat for your child, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. That's safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. Yo, what happened to you here? You have to experience what I just experienced. What'd you do? Stick your finger in an electric outlet or something? Close. I just listened to electric air. Electric air? Electric air? Can everyone stop repeating electric air and tell me what electric air is? Electric air will get your heart racing, neurons sparking, and lips smiling. Join me, Toby. As I shock your ears with EDM's greatest hits. Five out of five doctors agree one hour of electric air every week is just what you need to increase your energy and leave you feeling stimulated. Side effects may include uncontrollable mood swings, shuffling, and in some extreme cases, headbanging. Too much headbanging, huh? Dude, those side effects are serious. Seriously amazing. (laughs) So join me every Wednesday night at 8 for Electric Air on the voice of NASA Community. College 90.3 WHPC. 90.3 WHPC wants you to know that as early as elementary school, students who miss just two days of school per month are likely to fall behind in reading, writing, and math. And just two absences per month make students less likely to graduate from high school, even if the absences are excused. Attending school every day increases a child's chances of success in school and in life. Learn more at absencesaddup.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Education, Charles Stewart. Stewart Mott Foundation, the Ad Council, and the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Jacob Volk. Jacob Volk. 
appreciate that. <laughs> I love this. It cracks me up every time, man. <laughs> you get here every time. Uh, yeah, just, <laughs> isn't it great? Oh my gosh. You're listening to Beyond the Game on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3.